I want to bring a message to you this morning that I've titled, Considering the Cross and the Curse. Now, this is a, a sermon that is atypical for me. Uh, there are no points. There's no one, two, three. There's no ABCs. None of those things. It's just a, a straight sermon this morning for us to consider the cross and the curse. John in chapter 19, as Brother Andy had already read this morning, verses 1 through 3, uh, brings us to that point where Jesus Christ has, had gone through all that he did and was getting ready to go through more. And verse 1 says, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and, and scourged him, and the soldiers platted a crown of thorns, and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe, and said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they smote him with their hands. Now, as we've mentioned, we have Resurrection uh, Weekend coming up at the end of this month. And so this, this entire month, we want to focus around that cross, around that event. We want to look at what the Lord Jesus Christ went through for us to be here this morning. And that's what we need to understand. Now, I listened to, uh, there was uh, some complications Wednesday with getting the, the feed out for, for Kelton's sermon uh, in midweek, and I am ever so grateful that he was able to do that while, whilst we were away in, in, in Manchester. And, uh, but I listened to it this morning, and it was spot on. It was absolutely spot on. And uh, we're going to get it uploaded and get it out to everyone uh, this week. But the reason I'm bringing that to you was, uh, you know, was the theme of his sermon about those ten lepers and the nine who didn't come back. They had no gratitude. They were ungrateful for what Jesus Christ had done. And it's sometimes we got to ask ourselves, are we much different than those nine? Or are we going to be like the one that came back and said, you know, Lord, then praise your name. Thank you so very much. And, uh, you know, and again, uh, you know, where are our priorities? What are we doing uh, Wednesday night, Sunday morning? Where are we going to be? And, and, and that's what we want to look at. We want to consider what Christ did on the cross because of the curse that was upon mankind, the work that he went through, what he endured that day. We see in that opening text that he was scourged. That it says that Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. To scourge someone is to flog them. But a more precise term uh, or definition of the word scourge means to pull apart, okay? To make a scourge means to literally pull the leather apart, pull things apart to see, uh, to make it what it is. And we would call that a cat of nine tails. And what a scourge would be would be long pieces of, of leather, much like a, a horse's tail, if you will. And intertwined inside that leather, leather was stones and pieces of bone and, and pieces of metal. And as it would lock into our Savior's back, they would literally pull apart his flesh off of his body. So he was scourged for us. Isaiah 53 tells us in whose stripes we are healed. We'll see that verse here in just a little bit. But not only that, the Bible says that they platted a crown of thorns. Now ladies know what that word platted means. Most men probably don't know, but uh, the word plat means to braid. They took a, a, a group of thorns, guys, and in three or four layers deep, and they began to braid those things together to make a laurel, if you will, a crown of thorns. And they placed it on our Savior's head. And this is just a handful of days before the Lord would be betrayed uh, when we find a, a third time that he prophesied what was going to happen on this particular day. In Matthew, in chapter 20, verse 19, it says, and, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. So that mocking was not just the robe. It was not just them smiting him with their hands. It was not just them bowing before him saying, Hell, King of the Jews. They mocked him with a crown of thorns. They mocked him out, if you will. Jesus would be crucified on a Wednesday at 9 a.m. He would be laid in the tomb by or before 6 p.m. and resurrected on a Saturday at 6 p.m. or sundown, if you will. So therefore, the statement he makes in Matthew 20, verses 18 to 19, is the same claim that he made while it's in Caesarea Philippi in Matthew 16, 21, as well as, as in Matthew 17, verses 22 and 23. Jesus Christ foretold the events of his crucifixion day. The disciples were forewarned, and in reality, we should step back and say, they should have known. They should have known what was going to happen when they went in there. But the scourging had to occur, my friend. Isaiah 53 and verse 5. 
But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. The crown of thorns must have happened that day. It had to happen because it was the original sin in the garden which brought forth thorns in the first place. In Genesis chapter 3, and looking in uh, verses 17 and 18, it says unto Adam, he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground, watch this, for thy sake. In other words, it's your fault, Adam. He says, uh, In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Beloved, thorns are a result of sin. They are a constant painful reminder of mankind's falling away from a perfect God within a perfect environment. You know, guys, we have these climate nutcases today, these climate change lunatics. And if you think that's not a religion, guys, listen, I got a bridge to sell you in New York. Amen. It is just as much a religion as Satanism. It's just as much as religion. Religion is Babylonianism. Matter of fact, all three of them are tied together. Amen. This land and this earth is cursed because of the sin of mankind. And that's all there is to it. There is no other way to look at it. That's exactly how it is. But guys, it doesn't matter. Adam was in a perfect environment. He had a perfect God, and he still sinned before God Almighty when there was only one commandment, one, amen, to follow. Those thorns, every time they stick you in the fingers when you're on a walk on a path. I grew up in southwest Florida where we have these things called sand spurs, or sand spurs, and uh, they're horrible. I'm going to go ahead and tell you. I mean, when you step on them, they got thorns going in every direction. So you, there's no way to pull them out uh, easy. It's going to hurt either which way about it. These little bitty balls with its thorns going everywhere. But guys, that is what sin has done. Proverbs 22 verse 5 says, Thorns and snares uh, are in the way of the froward. He that do, uh, doth keep his soul shall be far from them. You know what froward means? Froward means twisted. It means distorted, it means crooked, it means perverse or perverted. Wicked and vile sin. The way of the forward is a crooked way. The way of the forward is a twisted way, it's a distorted way, it's a crooked way. And we live in a world today that has a distorted view of everything, if you will. Lord Jesus Christ compared false prophets and false preachers to those thorns in Matthew chapter 7. Verses 15 and 16, he says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are raving wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruit. Doth men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? My friend, a false prophet cannot but tell lies. He cannot but tell lies. He cannot bring forth good fruit. And these, and these men who stand in pulpits lying every Sunday, correcting the scriptures, perverting them, if you will, they are but a thorn in this world, lying and deceiving the multitudes. They'll stand, they'll stand against the truth today, but they're going to stand before that very truth at the judgment seat. Beloved, it is rebellion, this sin, this devilish act of governing mankind, which brings forth the pain felt across the brow of a perfect Redeemer, our wonderful Savior, a sinless Creator. And yet he wore a crown that day. He wore a crown of thorns, a crown, the consequence of sin, which pierces the mind, body, and the soul, the very sin he was paying for, paying the price for that day, yet not his own. The Bible says, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sins, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Beloved, you understand here today that not only do you have a crown of thorns, which is a constant perpetual reminder of the pain of sin, not only was he uh, cast upon a, a purple robe uh, in the similitude of royalty and mocked out and beaten with open hands and then scourged having his, his, his body flayed open and blood absolutely everywhere. But to top it all off, when he was crucified, he couldn't be crucified just by himself. But he must have been aligned amongst the guilty. 
John in chapter 19 tells us in verse 18 where they crucified him and two other with him on either side one and Jesus in the midst. Isaiah chapter 53 tells us in verse 12, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul into death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Can you picture that with us today? You see, beloved, the same word that is used for that thieves, the thieves, if you will, but the thief on the right hand, the thief on the left hand, the same ones, and he was numbered amongst the transgressors, and he was swapped out for an insurrection as a murderer by the name of Barabbas, and, and Jesus Christ in the middle, and one on the right hand, one on the left hand. And so here he was there, numbered amongst the transgressors, but the Bible says that he made intercession for the transgressors, plural. You see, the transgressors, plural, he's making intercession for. We know there's one uh, thief that was on the cross that confessed him and said, hey, listen, remember me when you come into paradise. And Jesus Christ said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. But Isaiah says there he was making intercession for the transgressors, plural. You know what that means? We are just like the transgressors that were by him on either side. That is speaking of us. We are the thieves, we are the transgressors, we are the sinners that Jesus Christ made intercession before the Father, amen, that our sins may be cleansed, that we may be whole, that we may be healed and come before him in his righteousness. In John 19, he goes on to tell us in verses 23 and 24, then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart and also his coat Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. And they said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it. Whose is is it shall be, and that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, for my vesture they did uh, cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. You see, his crucifixion must have taken place. His precious hands and feet must have been driven through with the nails. Psalm 22 tells us clearly that I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted before or in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me to, uh, into the dust of death, for the dogs have come as me about. Or compass me, and the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and they, my feet. I may tell all my bones. They should, they they look and they stare upon me. Verse eighteen. They part my garments among them, and cast lots upon my vesture. You see, the, the Psalm twenty two we know is a messianic psalm, as Psalm twenty three and twenty four. Psalm 22 is the prophecy that not only would Jesus Christ's whole body be just poured out like water, a a beaten lump of mass upon a a piece of wood for the sins of mankind, that they would pierce his hands and his feet, uh, that his bones may not be broken, but his body poured out like water. And yet we find that just the simple fact that his garments, they would gamble. Who was going to take his garments that day? Think about that. Think about the vileness of that. For sports lovers today, they, they go. I remember when I was a, a little kid, uh, Pittsburgh Steelers, you remember this advert for Coca-Cola? Big G, Mean Joe Green was walking off in the tunnel, and a little boy gave him a Coca-Cola, and he drank it. A Coke and a smile, they used to say on the adverts. And the little boy was standing there, Mean Joe Green had his jersey, sat on his shoulder pads, and he said, hey, kid. And he threw the jersey, and the kid caught it, and it was like, whoo, it made his day, made his life, Amen. Before sports fans, you can go to whatever sports you're in love with and get a jersey signed, or they'll throw their jersey in the crowd. Everybody, it's an old collectibles, if you will. That's a celebratory event when they're playing a game, but this is no game on the cross of Calvary. This is no game. Nobody's playing around. Guys, this was a murder that was occurring. They are casting lots. They are gambling on who was going to take the blood-drenched garment of the one that they had beaten beyond recognition that day. They wanted a memory of the vile act that they performed. And they cast lots for it. Think about it, my friend. His body broken, not a bone. 
his hands, his feet pierced, his garments stripped and gambled for the population of Jerusalem, gaping upon his battered and bleeding flesh. The real picture of what sin brings forth. James said in James 1.15, then, uh, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And when sin is finished, it bringeth forth death. Just think about it for a second this morning, beloved. The consequence of sin demanded the cross of Christ. The consequence of sin demanded the crown of thorns become an emblem of such result. The painful reminder of rebellion against the Word of God, the Creator looked upon His creation. He saw the tragedy of mankind's choice and their broken connection between God and Himself, their darkened heart. And you know what He said? I'll pay for it. I'll take it upon myself. I'll go and suffer and endure. I'll go down there and spend a, a lifetime with them, showing them the goodness of God, the goodness of the Savior, the goodness of the Son of God. And then at the end of it all, I'll show unto this world what sin really does to mankind. Now here's what I want you to think about this morning. When you consider the cross, when you consider Christ, when you consider His execution, when you consider the curse that placed Him there. The Bible tells us in John chapter 3 and verse 16, the most famous verse of all time, the Bible tells us, Therefore God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. I'll stop you there in the verse. Just for a second. Now consider the cross with me, if you will. Consider the crown of thorns, consider the pain, consider the anguish, consider the suffering, consider the separation of the Father solely because He so loved the world. We have a generation of young people today, and this may sound odd to you, but we have a generation of young people today who struggle with, the worth, with self-worth. Now, with all the, uh, the people on, on, on Instagram and influencers and TikTok and all of these other things, you know, in reality, uh, we sit back and we go, how in the world are they struggling with self-worth? Because they think they're worth more than they really are. It's all a veneer. It's all a veneer. They're acting that way. No more. They're like a bunch of blowfish is what they are. They are. Blowfish is, is, is little... A blowfish, now, I mean, what a blowfish's first line of defense is to make itself look bigger than it really is. That's what it wants to do. Now, its final line of defense is all those pricks and the poison that it has inside of it when a fish bigger than them eats them, yeah. But its first line of defense is to make itself look bigger than it really is. And we have a generation of young people today on social media, living their entire life on a digital format, not real life, looking bigger than they really are. And you want to know why? Because this world has forsaken the Word of God, and our young people today are suffering from self-worth. Parents are forsaking the house of God, and children have paid the price. Mom and Daddy, it's your fault. Amen. You take your children, you go ahead and take them to the pitch on a Sunday. And when they die off and, and, and fall off to the depths of hell, that blood is on your hand, amen. Now, I'm not trying to be mean today, but I am being kind because I'm telling you the truth. You want to talk about self-worth? Do you understand what the human soul is worth? It's worth the life. Of the Son of God. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Gave it. Here it is. To put a crown of thorns on, to be beaten, to be mocked out, uh, mocked out with a robe, be hit with sticks, to have His beard plucked out, to be scourged, nailed to a tree, to be mocked out, His garments stripped naked, His garments be gambled for. To finally give up the ghost, to be buried in a grave. Matter of fact, get buried in not even his own grave. You want to know what you're worth today? The Bible tells us, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. True love is a man. Better yet, true love is where the God-man, paying the price for the sins of the world, sins he did not commit, sins he could not commit, for a group of people who did commit them, knowing full well 
The same people he was dying for, paying for, suffering for, bleeding for, being beaten for, will one day overwhelmingly reject him to his face. They'll mock him. They'll ignore him their entire life. Yet he died for them anyway. Think about it. You think about it. Before reading the condition of receiving that love, you think about what he did. And you think about how he did it. You believe in an omnipotent God that he's everywhere all the time? You believe in an all-powerful God? Yeah, but do you believe in an omniscient God, one that knows all, sees all? And yet God the Father sent the Son of God who equally knows everything, amen? Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. He says, I and the Father are one. He knew full well that the overwhelming majority of the population of his creation would reject him to his face. And yet he died for him anyway. The condition of that salvation and whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You, I ask you today, what's more important to you this morning than what Jesus Christ did on the cross? What's more important? Brother, Brother Kelton preached it Wednesday night. Nine reasons, nine excuses people make forsaking that, for forsaking the house of God, for forsaking God, forsaking the Bible, for fa- forsaking the will of God. What do we put in front of Him? When we stop and we think of what He truly did. We're going to look at a, at a series of verses in closing here in just a second. From Psalm 104. I'm going to chuck them on the screens for you for ease. But did you know this morning, all creation obeys the voice of God. In closing, I want you to see these. Psalm 104, bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. Who laid, verse 5, who laid the foundation of the earth, that it should not be removed forever. Verse 6, thou coverest it with a deep, as with a garment, the waters stood above the mountains, it says. Verse 9, thou, speaking of God, the Creator, thou hast set a bound that it may not pass over, that they turn not against to cover the earth. Verse 11, they give drink to every beast of the field, the wild asses quench their thirst. In other words, the water goes where God says it to go. And guess what? It stops where he stops it. Verse 16, the trees of the Lord are full of sap, the cedars of Lebanon, which he hath planted. Verse 19, he appointed the moon for season, the sun knoweth his going down. Thou makest darkness, and it is night, wherein all the beasts of the forest do creep forth. Verse 22, the sun ariseth. They gather themselves together and lay them down in their dens. Verse 23, man goeth forth unto his work and do his labor until evening. O Lord, how manifold of thy works and the wisdom. In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth, watch this, is full of thy riches. Do you see it this morning? All of creation obeys the Lord. Every whim, every word, every word. All of creation obeys. But one. But one. Mankind. The sun listeth wherever he says it. The the, the wind blows wherever he tells it to blow. The sun comes up, the moon goes up. Everything uh, operates according to God's will and God's word. Except for us. Mankind's the only one that will look God in the face and say, I ain't going to do it. The Bible says, forsake not the assemblies of the self together. God said, mankind looks at God and says, I got something more important to do today. I have something more I need to attend to. The Bible says that, that we ought to give heed to his word. We say, well, you know what? I'll get to it when I can. 
The Bible tells us uh, uh, to pray without ceasing. Well, I don't have time right now, but I'll get to it when it's more convenient. Beloved, I just want you to consider the cross this morning. Consider the curse that, that made the cross uh, 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 necessary. Upon the cross, they, they nailed our Lord's hands and feet. The feet, though, you see, the, the crucifixion was an instrument of cruelty, a tool of painful death, meant to strike fear in those that witnessed it. And therefore, after nailing his feet to a tree, a little perch. I mean, is it not bad enough to put a big old spike through your feet? <laughs> to put it through your hands after being beaten like you were? Your back exposed down to the bone and the sinews of your body upon a tree? Guys, that, listen, I know we got an emblem of cross, and, and we think that that beam was a, that cross itself, the upright, was a, this well-hewn and sanded. It wasn't that. It more than likely was an actual tree that they stuck the cross beam that he carried on top of it. That little perch at the bottom of our Savior's feet Almost like a little window seal, if you will. Right there where his heels would be. It was there so it would enable him to lift up the body just enough to collect a breath, thus extending the time of death for hours. The suffering. Amazingly, beloved, when, when, when the curse was placed upon this earth because of mankind's sin. The Lord said this upon to the serpent. All of these things considered. Genesis 3, man. The Lord looked down and said to this willing participant for Satan, he said this in Genesis 3. He said in Genesis 3, verses 14 and 15, he said, The Lord God said unto the servant, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field. Upon the belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Verse 15 is where I want you to focus. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. And it, the seed of the woman, shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. You see, the seed of the woman became Jesus Christ. And the bruising of the heel, we understand that there, there's, there's going to be a final moment when Satan is destroyed. And, and we have that envision, that vision of when, you know, the second coming of Christ. We understand all of that. End of the millennial kingdom. But the bruising of his heel began on Calvary. As Christ hung on that cross. And he pushed up with every fiber of his being upon his heel on that, church, that perch. Just to get a breath inside. When he hung there paying for the curse of mankind. The beauty of it all is found in 1 Corinthians 15. Verses 55 and 57, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? He said, the sting of death is sin. Let me ask you something. When those thorns, those stinging nettles we have over here, I mean, those things are horrible, amen? When they pierce your skin, what do they do? They sting, don't they? But the Bible says the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Beloved, when I consider the cross, I must consider the curse. For without one, the other would be unneeded. Because of both, we have a Christ, and the sting of death is nullified to those who believe, and the grave is rendered powerless, all because God has given us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who said this, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the works of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. That's it. Done. When you consider the cross because of the curse, 
My friend, we have a Christ that we can abound in, that we can stand in his work unmovable in this world today because of the beauty of such an ugly day. The beauty of the results of the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, all of which was prophecy fulfilled. The beauty in giving us the victory and a peace that passeth all understanding. Will you bow your heads here this morning? Father, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity and time to be together today. I ask of you now that if you will, dear Lord, help us continue to focus steadfastly upon what you have done for us, who and what you are to us, that we would not only consider the cross, but the curse that puts you there, but the Christ, which means the anointed one, our Lord and our Savior, Father, every step of the way, every single day, that, Lord, we would not be so easily moved by the things of this life, the things of this world. We would focus upon you and that which you have done. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.